If you have your Bibles this morning, I want you to turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 16. And while you're turning there, 2 Samuel 16, I'll give you the background, a little bit of the background to this story I'm going to read. Uh, the setting is, at this time, Absalom is trying to take the throne from his father, King David. And David is a very experienced fighting man, and so are the men traveling with him. And they are they're mighty men. The Bible describes them as mighty men of valor. But David doesn't want to have to kill his son Absalom, and so David made the decision to flee from Jerusalem where his throne was, that was the headquarters of his kingdom. And as he leaves, in the first four verses of this, I'm not going to read those, but in the first four verses, Ziba, who is the servant of Mephibosheth, who is the grandson of Saul, who used to be king. Are you with me? Ziba comes out and meets David and lies to David and tells him that Mephibosheth is staying in Jerusalem hoping that Saul's kingdom will be restored to him now that David is fleeing. He lies to David about Mephibosheth's loyalty, which only serves to wound David's heart all the more because David has been good to Mephibosheth. Lies. And then as David and those who are traveling with him move on as they approach by Huram, and this is the story I'm going to read. They go through this narrow passageway, a ravine really, between two hills. And as they're traveling through this narrow passageway, there's a man named Shimei who is walking parallel to them on top of one of those ridges. And as they walk below, and as he walks above, this is the story that happens. He starts throwing stones at King David. And so let me, let me read. So David, this is at an all-time low for David. David, is he's been betrayed by his own son. He's discouraged. He's heartbroken. He's been lied to. He's probably depressed. And this is the second time he's had to flee into the wilderness to save his life. The first time was when Saul, who was just jealous and raged against David, pursued him into the wilderness to kill him. And now his own son. And so let's read. I want to pick up in verse 5 of Second Samuel 16, and you can follow with me. As King David approached Bahurim, a man from the same clan as Saul's family came out from there. His name was Shimei, son of Gera, and he cursed as he came out. He pelted David and all the king's officials with stones, though all the troops and the special guard were on David's right and left. As he cursed, Shimei said, Get out! Get out, you man of blood, you scoundrel! The Lord has repaid you for all the blood you shed in the household of Saul, in whose place you have reigned. The Lord has handed the kingdom over to your son Absalom. You have come to ruin because you are a man of blood. And then Abishai, this is David's friend, the son of Zeruiah said to the king, why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over and cut off his head. I guess it could be good to have a friend like Abishai 
But the king said, what do you and I have in common, you sons of Zeruiah? This is kind of like saying, this is my business, not yours. If he is cursing because the Lord said to him, curse David, who can ask, why do you do this? David then said to Abishai and all his officials, my son, who is of my own flesh, is trying to take my life. How much more than this Benjamite? Leave him alone. Let him curse, for the Lord has told him to. Now look at verse 12. It may be that the Lord will, give, will, will see my distress and repay me with good for the cursing I am receiving today. So David and his men continued along the road while Shimei was going along the hillside opposite him, cursing as he went and throwing stones at him and showering him with dirt. The king and all the people with him arrived at their destination exhausted. What a good word. And there he refreshed himself. And if you don't mind standing for, for prayer, I want to talk to you this morning on the subject of throwing stones. Throwing stones. Now, Father, we, we stand in honor of the reading of your holy word. And I pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would illuminate these scriptures to us and that you would open the eyes of our heart to see and open the ears of our understanding to receive everything that you would speak to us this day through your word and through the preaching of your word. I pray that everyone in this room, as well as those watching our program, would feel and sense the presence of your Holy Spirit as you minister to each one who hears. And we give you praise for it, and it's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Some of you probably are not aware of some of the great engineering feats of my dad, who is sitting in the back back there. And he got his ability from his dad, my grandfather, who actually invented probably one of the first hedge trimmers made out of an old lawnmower that two people would stand on either side of the hedge and hold the lawnmower about head high to clip the top of the hedge. Well, we used to not have weed eaters, if you can imagine that, a day when we didn't have such things. And my dad decided there was an easier way to trim the grass around trees and places that the lawnmower couldn't reach. And so he took an old vacuum cleaner motor and attached it to the end of a metal pole. And he invented one of the first grass trimmers. Tommy, do you remember this? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, he said. I don't, I don't remember what he used for the string at the other end, but whatever it was, it was durable. It was, it was tough. And now, I'm, I'm not a mechanical engineer, so I don't know the actual RPMs of a weed eater motor. But for the sake of comparison, if the RPMs of a weed eater are 1,000 RPMs, then the RPMs of a vacuum cleaner motor must be about 10,000 RPMs. <laughs> and so dad, dad ran that thing around a big, I think it was a big oak tree we had in our yard, and it just immediately ate right through the bark into the wood. I think, he, I think you could cut trees down with it. And then he ran it down the edge of our concrete porch at 2123 Parkway Drive, in North Little Rock, and, and it cut a groove down the edge of that concrete porch that's probably still there to this day. And uh, when he cranked up that homemade weed eater, it threw rocks and projectiles in all directions and sent Tommy and me and probably any other kid in the neighborhood running for dear life because we were being shot at. And this was in the day before you ever gave thought to 
wearing personal protection equipment, you know, like goggles and, and things to uh, protect yourself. You know, it's really a wonder, I guess, that kids from my generation even survived when you think about it. My point is, I know what it feels like to get hit by rocks. And I bet some of you do too. And of course, we can laugh at things like that now, but you know, there's a different kind of stone than the rocks you threw as a kid. And they are the stones that life throws at you along your journey. And they hurt. Probably even more than the rocks you pick up from the ground. And so today I felt led to, to preach a message from a story about throwing rocks. And you know, when I read the Bible, and I've, I've kind of encouraged you to do this too, when I read the Bible, I tend to sort of put myself in the story, either as one of the characters of the story or at least as someone in the crowd watching this story as it unfolds. I'm just kind of a visual person like that, I guess. And sometimes when I read a story in the Bible and I put myself in the story, I find myself thinking, you know, it's probably best that I was not actually there that day as the event took place. Because I'm, I'm just not sure I would have handled it the same way that person handled it. And I think that's a pretty good indication that there's probably something I need to learn from the way that person handled the situation. Well, this is one of those stories. I mean, if I, if I was writing a book with this story in it, as the author of that book, I can think of several different ways this story could have ended than the way it did. And I bet you can too. So many things come to mind. If I'm David walking in that valley and some Yehu is on the hill throwing rocks and dirt clods at me, what would I do? Well, also this story is, is it's one of those stories that I, I don't know that I've ever actually preached a sermon on this story or not, but it's packed so full of wisdom and godliness for living our lives to the glory of God, it's a, a passage of scripture that's just rich with wisdom and theology for how we should live our lives. And so there's just no way for me to unpack and give you all of the meat of this passage of scripture in one meal. I mean, I could probably stand up here and and literally teach on this passage of scripture all day, just unpacking the richness of the story. But you all don't have to worry about that because you have a pastor who loves to eat lunch on Sunday afternoon. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not gonna be able to, to cover maybe everything, but I wanna, I wanna talk about three things. I've tried to simplify this, what I felt God had impressed upon my heart and I just want to talk about the pain of stones, which we all know. I want to talk about enduring the stones. How does David do what he does? How do you do that? And then lastly, I want to talk about a place called weary. And I will explain to you what that place is when we get there. So let me help you when life is throwing stones at you. And let's begin with the pain of stones. Now remember that this is happening at the worst time of David's life. It seems like life has a way of throwing stones at you when it just couldn't get any worse, right? David had certainly experienced God's power when he stood before the giant and he had experienced great deliverance when he was fighting the armies of Israel or the armies of Israel's enemies. But this comes at a time when he is literally watching people tear his world apart. There are people in David's life 
just tearing David's life apart. He had known God's power during times of great victory. But can you know God's power during a season of great pain? Now listen, we've all had little victories here and there where God's answered a prayer and you, you know God was in that. You've seen God's hand, but can you see God's hand in painful situations? I'm talking about the pain of stones. Now, the Bible narrative tells us that as David and his family and his men traveled through this narrow passage below, Shimei traveled along the hill above him and it says that he pelted David, pelted David, and all the king's officials with stones, pelted. That, 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 just that word kind of stings. And in verse 13, it says that as David and his men continued along the road, he was not only throwing stones at him, but he was lobbing clumps of dirt at him. And you know, I'm, I'm sure, as I read this, I'm sure David felt the sting of each stone that connected with him. I mean, I, I just wonder, maybe some of those stones left a bruise. Maybe, maybe some of them even broke the skin, causing the king to bleed. See, we, we read this and we think, oh, it's just rocks. No, you can, you can get hurt with rocks. Stones hurt. But what hurt even more than the stones that were hurled from the hands of Shimei were the stones that were hurled that day from the mouth of Shimei. The narrative tells us that as David traveled along the road, Shimei cursed David and hurled disparaging insults at David in front of everybody traveling with him as David was at his all-time low. I mean, do you, do, you, do you hear what I'm saying? He berated David. He belittled David. He made fun of him. He openly, he even openly pointed out David's most embarrassing mistakes and sins publicly to make sure that everyone knew about them. And he even told David that all the bad things going on in your life right now were nothing more than the hand of God punishing him for the sins he had committed. Wow, now that, that stings. So he said, get out, get out, you man of blood, you scoundrel. The Lord's repaid you for all the blood you shed in the household of Saul. David saved Saul's life. The Lord has handed the kingdom over to your son Absalom. Not true. You've come to ruin. You know, David felt like he had come to ruin. You've come to ruin because you're a man of blood. And do you know what made those words so painful to David? Because they had just enough truth in them to sting. Because David was carrying the weight of his own guilt and he felt those words of Shimei. He remembered the words of the prophet of God who said, the sword shall never depart from your household. And he knew, David knew that a lot of what Shimei said was in fact true. You see, as David left Jerusalem, he was carrying, can I say it this way, the baggage of his past, the baggage of his sins. He knew that he had indeed been a bad example for Absalom, his son, when he committed adultery with Bathsheba. And David knew that he was certainly guilty of shedding the innocent blood of Uriah, her husband. 
No wonder his own son now wanted to kill him and take his throne just like his dad had killed Uriah and had taken his wife. And so it was easy for David to feel the pain of those stones, the sting of those words. Oh, sure, he was throwing stones at David and even showering him with dirt, but the stones that are most painful in this world are not the stones hurled from the hand, but the stones of painful, cruel, and caustic words hurled from the mouth of someone who feels they are righteous enough to judge you. The stones hurled from the hand may have bruised and broken David's skin, but the stones hurled from Shimei's mouth penetrated deep into David's soul, don't they? It's the stones of words that hurt the most. Like a leper who was labeled with that stony word, unclean. Or a blind man labeled beggar. Or a half-dressed woman drugged by the arm into the public square and thrust in front of an onlooking crowd being pelted with the words, this woman was caught in the very act of adultery and the law says she should be stoned. What do you say, Jesus? And this world is full of people who've been wounded by words. Labels that someone else put on you that you cannot get rid of. Hateful and critical words that were spoken to you or about you that you cannot unhear. The disparaging words that have been used to define your character. Words spoken in derision of you. And they're all just stones hurled from the mouth. And these stones are the reproaches of the wicked. Let me tell you what we learn about the reproaches of the wicked from the story of Shimei throwing stones at David. If you've been the target of someone throwing stones at you, if you have a Shimei in your life, and you need to hear this. This is what we learn about the reproaches of the wicked. The wicked will always take advantage of your times of trouble and weakness. They'll wait for you to go through some hard time, some difficulty. They'll wait until the day of your adversity to cast their stones at you. That's what the wicked do. They'll also take on the form of virtue. As they focus on the defects of your character, they, they are good at reminding you, and everyone else for that matter, of your mistakes. They'll focus on your defects, your mistakes, your faults, even while their own life and conduct reveals a lack of sympathy for the kingdom of God and they'll do that so that they can assume a more virtuous looking posture to serve their own self-interests. I'm getting some amens on this. I see some of you have had stones thrown at you. But while the wicked will take advantage of your times of trouble and weakness, they forget that God warns the Shimeis of this world don't you lie and wait like a thief near the house of the righteous. Because even though the righteous may fall seven times, the righteous will rise again every time. You see, Shimei, you're going to meet David again just about three chapters over when he comes back to Jerusalem as king. Do you understand? David may be down right now. He may be discouraged. He's leaving Jerusalem. He may not be sitting on the throne right now, but God is. And God's not through with you yet. That's the message of God. 
In fact, it's just three chapters later, David comes back to Jerusalem when Absalom is dead. I'll talk more about that later. And if you're listening to me, your life has been blessed with a shimmy If you've been wounded by words, if you've experienced the stones of painful, cruel, caustic words hurled from the mouth of someone who feels they are righteous enough to judge you, I've come to remind you that you have a Savior who answers your cruel and caustic words with the words, let he who is without sin be the first to throw stones. Stones hurt. Let me talk about enduring the stones. I, I've experienced a lot of stones in this life, and some of you have too. I've had, I've had a lot of stones thrown my way over the years. And one thing I've learned from Jesus is when it comes to the stones of this life, I'd rather be the one enduring the stones than the one throwing the stones. If you want to see what strength and dignity and great character looks like, don't look at David standing in the valley of Elah before Goliath. Look at David walking in the valley below Shimei as he is pelted with clumps of dirt and stones while he is insulted and mocked in front of everybody. That's good. That's character. In fact, verse 13 is a picture of a man of great strength and character. It says, and David and his men just continued along the road while Shimei was going along the hillside opposite of him, cursing, throwing stones, and showering him with dirt. As I read this story the other day, it, you know, it occurred to me that David was a great slingman. I mean, he knew, he knew how to use a sling. Just ask Goliath. And at any moment of this, in this story, at, at any moment, if he had let those stones, those words get the better of him, he could have bent down and picked up one of those very stones that Shimei threw at him, put it in a sling, and returned it with such force as to rid the earth of Shimei. But he didn't do that. Wow. See, this is where I say maybe it would have been best if I had not been there when this actually happened. And you know, perhaps to make it even more tempting, there was his friend Abishai who said, let me go over there and cut off his head. I mean, this is the same Shimei who wanted to kill Saul when he was asleep in the camp of Israel with his spear stuck in the ground near his head in 1 Samuel chapter 26. This is the same Shimei who had helped his brother Joab murder Abner in 2 Samuel chapter 3. That Shimei, he is more than willing to kill people. And he said, let me go kill him for you. Have you ever had a friend like Abishai? I have. I, listen, many years ago, I, I worked with a guy. He and I became friends. He, he was a guy, let's just say he was, he was a lot less churchy than me. He's a great guy, but I don't know that he knew Jesus. And we were friends, even though he knew I was a man of faith and he was not. We were, we were friends. And when he heard one time about a man who did me horribly wrong, this man did something that was awful. And I didn't even know this guy. I had never met this guy. And one night we were working and my friend Abishai, <laughs> He got quiet. He was unusually quiet, very thoughtful one night, and, and sort of in the middle of the shift, he broke the silence, and he said, listen, I want to tell you something. 
He said, you've been a real friend to me, and I don't have many of those. He said, I know you're, you're a man, you're a religious man, but I'm not. He said, you say the word, and I'll take care of that guy for you. Well, well thank you, Abishai. <laughs> but this is probably my business. <laughs> he was my Abishai. But this was my greatest opportunity to show this man what Christ is like. He knew I was a religious man, his words. And this was my chance to prove it. And David, was, David has the greatest opportunity to show Abishai and the rest of his men what real greatness really looks like in a man of God. You see, God will, God, are you hearing what I'm saying? God will let you be pelted with stones and dirt by this world to give you opportunities to be a real witness to the world about what Christianity and being a Christian is all about. So David has this conversation with Abishai and he tells Abishai, this is my business. And if he's cursing because the Lord said to him, curse David, then how can I question what's happening in my life right now? How can I say, why do you do this? And David said, leave him alone. Let him curse, for the Lord has told him to. Can you say that about people who are cursing you and mocking you and throwing stones at you? Can you say, maybe God is using this? <laughs> I'm about to amen myself. Now listen, that doesn't mean that God literally spoke to Shimei and said, hey, go down there and curse David and throw stones at him. No, that's not what he's saying. But it does mean that David saw the loving hand of God working in his adversities to discipline him. Oh, okay. Y'all aren't going to like this part. And that's okay. I don't either. But it's true. I'm sure you probably didn't come to church to hear me say that when you're being insulted and mocked and someone is throwing stones at you and you want God to deliver you from it all and strike them dead, you didn't come to church to hear me say that sometimes God just wants you to take it <laughs> because God works through our troubles and trials and our adversities to make us a better man or woman of God. And David recognized that God's hand is not only at work in his life when he stands in victory before Goliath, but God's hand is even at work in his life when he's enduring the stones of Shimei. So maybe you came here today hoping to get some great answer from God about the struggles that you're going through right now, the stones that are being hurled at you. But I'm going to tell you that sometimes the answer is exactly what we find in verse 13. It says that David and his men just continued along the road. You need to just, sometimes you just need to fix your eyes on the road in front of you and just keep on walking down the road. The key to enduring the stones is not necessarily some great, powerful, miraculous deliverance. Sometimes the key to enduring the stones in this life is just to keep walking. Just don't stop. Just don't get sidetracked with dealing with Shimei. Just keep walking down the road. Keep putting one foot in front of the other. I told you you wouldn't like this part, but it's true. Just keep walking. Move on. David knew that God was still working out his perfect will for his life, even as he endured the stones of Shimei. And never, never did David stand taller than he did in the valley next to Shimei. So if you're struggling, if you've ever struggled to endure the stones thrown at you in this life, you need to underline verse 12. I've underlined it in my Bible. 
It may be that the Lord will see my distress and repay me with good for the cursing I'm receiving today. <laughs> if you've ever struggled with enduring the stones, you need to underline that verse. It may be that God will see my distress and repay me with good for the cursing I'm receiving today. David knew that although he had left his throne in Jerusalem, God was still on his throne. And David knew, listen to me, that one day God will balance the books. I don't have to. God will take care of those people who throw the stones. And God will take care of those people who endure the stones. God knows what you endure for his kingdom. And God will one day repay you with good. God will bless those who endure. It is the promise of the word of God. Now, before I run out of time, because I do like to eat lunch, for real, I want to talk to you about a place called Weary. Notice verse 14, the king and all the people with him arrived at their destination exhausted, exhausted. What a good word to describe how we feel. <laughs> and there he refreshed himself. I want you to see two words, exhausted. Some translations read weary and refreshed. When you endure suffering, it can absolutely be exhausting, especially over a period of time. That's just a good word for it. Now, now in some translations of the Bible, this verse is actually confusing. The wording just doesn't seem to make sense or it seems a little off in some of the English translations, especially with, with regard to where they end up. So, for instance, the, the New King James Version says, Now the king and all the people who were with him became weary, so they refreshed themselves there. Where? The King James Version translates it as, And the king and all the people that were with him came weary and refreshed themselves there. And it leaves you wondering where there is. They came weary and refresh themselves where? And some translations actually say they arrived at the Jordan, but the Jordan is just not in the Hebrew right there. So the NIV tries to sort of clarify the wording simply by saying they reached their destination and they refreshed, he refreshed himself there. But where did they refresh themselves? Well, let me see if I can answer that for you because I think if you're experiencing the stones of life, you need to know where you find your refreshing. Amen? Now, the Hebrew word that's translated as weary in the New King James Version, it seems that some scholars believe that that Hebrew word should actually be considered as a proper name of a place. In fact, one, one, as I researched this, one of the commentaries that I read suggested that it was an inn where travelers could stop to rest. And it's been suggested by some scholars that the name of this inn was probably Rest for the Weary. Imagine that on a sign next to the road. Rest for the Weary. And they think that gradually over time it just was shortened to simply weary. I've had times in my life where I felt like that's where I lived. A place called weary. Right? Now how in the world can you find a refreshing at a place called weary. I mean, that's just not some place you pick on a map and go, let's, let's take a vacation there. 
and get refreshed. Well, let's look at the word refreshed. The Hebrew word translated refreshed is a word that means, listen, you'll love this, to breathe. To breathe. I mean, do you ever feel like you just need a place to catch your breath? That, that Hebrew word can also mean to breathe upon. Now we're getting somewhere. In the Hebrew, the word for spirit of God, ruach, is a word that literally means breath. So you see, no matter where you are, even when you are exhausted at a place called weary, it is in God's presence that he breathes a refreshing into your spirit. It is the breath of God that gave man life to begin with, and it is still the breath of God that refreshes man's soul. And that's why Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are Listen, weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Rest for the weary. And David refreshed himself. In fact, in another place, this isn't the first time David refreshed himself. In another place, it says, and he refreshed himself in the Lord. You've got to learn to refresh yourself in the Lord at a place called weary. Now, you know, the end of the story is really incredible. And I don't want to leave you hanging. I just want to read a piece of the ending to you because I want you to know what it's like to have this kind of refreshing. It's found in chapter 19. And it's from verses 16 to 23 turns out that when David returned to Jerusalem after Absalom had died, this same Shimei was one of the first people to rush out and meet David and welcome him back to Jerusalem as king. And even, they even rushed out and helped carry their belongings over the Jordan. Down, down at the bottom in the second part of verse 17, they rushed to the Jordan where the king was. They crossed the ford to take the king's household over and to do whatever he wished. Now look at this. When Shimei... Same Shimei. When he crossed the Jordan, he fell prostrate before the king and said to him, May my Lord not hold me guilty. Oh, wait a minute. You were cursing the king, pelting him with rocks and, and, and clumps of dirt. And now he bows before the king and says, do not, do not remember how your servant did wrong on the day my Lord the king left Jerusalem. May the, see, they take advantage of the day you leave, but when God brings you back, well, what's that about? God's showing you their true colors. <laughs> you know, I've had people that wanted to be my friend when I was on top, but when I went through a valley, they didn't seem to like me until I was back on top again. May the king put it out of his mind, he said. For I, your servant, know that I have sinned, but today I have come here as the first of the whole house of Joseph to come down and meet my Lord the king. And here's Abishai, verse 21. Then Abishai said to Zeruiah, son of Zeruiah said, shouldn't Shimei be put to death for this? He cursed the Lord's anointed. There's that friend again. And David replied, again, he kind of says, you know, this is my business. And he says, should anyone be put to death in Israel today? Now, pay close attention to this. Do I not know that today I am the king over Israel? And so he said to Shimei, I'm not going to kill you. Listen, don't ever forget who God says you are. David says, why do I need to strike him dead? Do I not know what God has done in my life? God has made me king. I'm king. Whether Shimei likes it or not. Never lose sight of what God says about you. 
Maybe you've come to this service feeling weary. Maybe this world's been throwing stones your way. Maybe you've heard the words someone spoke against you. Perhaps those stones sank into your heart and wounded your soul. And maybe you're at a place called weary. Listen to the message of God. Keep your eyes on the road before you. Continue along the road. Keep walking. God's hand is working his perfect will in your life. Not just when you're victorious over the giants, but also when you're traveling the road enduring the stones. And you may say, Pastor, how can I do that? I hear you and I amen the, the word, but how does, how does one do this? Let me tell you one more thing about David that I'm going to just end with that will help you endure the stones. Y'all know David wrote some of the Psalms, right? There's one Psalm that David actually wrote while traveling that road into exile and it is Psalm number three. It is the first of the Psalms that appears with a title. And you know what the title is? Here's the title. A Psalm of David when he fled from his son Absalom. And in this Psalm he tells God, many rise against me. Many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. And here's the word of God for somebody that, that God laid on my heart for someone. David says, but you God are a shield around me. Imagine him saying this as he is being pelted with the stones that Shimei is throwing. You, Lord, are a shield around me. You bestow glory on my head. I may be covered in dirt, but you bestow glory on my head and you lift my head. So when the world is throwing stones at you, how wonderful it is to know that God is a shield around you and he is the lifter of your head and he will bestow glory on you even while the world is throwing dirt. Hallelujah. Somebody needed this. Would you stand with me? Hallelujah. Keep walking. Keep traveling the road. Keep your eyes on the road. Don't pay attention to Shimei. Hallelujah. God, today I lift up everyone who has heard this message and who is experiencing the stones of life being thrown at them. God, there are those who've heard words, stones that were thrown from someone's mouth, words that penetrated deeply. And it's hard to unhear those. It's hard to just ignore the, the effects of those. I pray right now, whoever out there is listening to this, God, that it is that, that applies to, I pray that you will touch them and heal the wounds left by words. Those stones that have been thrown, God, I pray that you will heal and restore. And I pray for anyone discouraged as they travel the road that they will be able to just keep their eyes on the road and keep walking, knowing that one day, God, you will balance the books. You will set things right. And I thank you that this day, God, you are truly a shield around us and the lifter of our heads. Thank you for that, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, I pray a blessing over these people. I pray that you will watch over them, that you will cause your face to shine upon them, give them your favor and your peace. Bring us back safely to your house where we will worship you and we will learn together 
from your word. And we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.